brought to you by PrayLatin.com, makers of prayer cards featuring complete English phonetic renderings of Latin pronunciations. There has been a growing resistance to the modernists from among some of the better bishops, with the past few months showing several of them becoming more and more vocal in their opposition. Two of them are featured in this video today, and I'll have something more for this weekend from another one of whom is having his homeland visited by Francis this week on a trip to the World Congress of Traditional Religions, a visit that the preconciliar popes not only would not have attended themselves, but would have likely threatened excommunication on any prelate who dared to suggest that the pontiff, the vicar of Christ, would attend such an event. Our times are certainly complicated, made all the worse by those who think a pontiff can't do any wrong but even more so by the cowardice of many to not act in faithful resistance against the modernists. And by faithful resistance, I mean by keeping the faith and resisting by correcting modernist errors regardless of the cost and not following their stupid plans in, before leading the church off into the pit. Now, this is due in part to our distorted sense of the papacy. As an office held by God, a God-chosen oracle that many Catholics have, several prelates in the past couple of weeks point out this distortion of our sense of the papacy and the rule or role of the Supreme Pontiff in everyday life of the church, we, have a, we suffer under distortion. Modern Catholics have a notion that the Pope is chosen by the Holy Spirit, which if you told that to someone before the 20th century, they'd look at you like you didn't know your own faith. It's very much a modern idea, but one that leads to a kind of papalatry, a sort of idolizing the Pope or turning him into a divine oracle. That conception of the Pope that we have now in the church is much closer to the Protestant caricature of the papacy than most Catholics would like to admit. But our times of crisis in the church and recent papacies, all promoting or allowing error to fester into this nightmare clown church we're in now, presents an opportunity to cast this papalatry aside and consign it to the dustbin of history. As Bishop Athanasius Schneider notes in a recent interview with Herate Chely, quote, Maybe this crisis, which we are now experiencing, will help the church to be more balanced in its attitude towards the Pope, and to avoid this extreme, unhealthy papalatry and divinization of the Pope, when there is an objective danger to the common good of the church. End quote. At the very least, we should hope that we find a balanced approach when and if we get a good Pope again, though I have a pretty extreme view of when the last good Pope was, which was for my money in the first half of Pius XII's reign before he started giving leeway to the enemy within the church to monkey with the liturgical and devotional life of the church. Now, on that note, mentioning the, the liturgical life of the church, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano gave an interview to a website called Pax Liturgique. And the interview was about the liturgy and his call for bishops of the church to celebrate the apostolic mass, regardless of whatever Rome may think about it. And I'm not really interested in diving here into the TLM versus Novus Ordo debate. Vigano presents something else here that is worth noting. That as a consequence of this papalatry, and, e and even councilolatry, if I can risk coining a clumsy word here, we've had the understanding of what the Catholic Church is changed by the modernists fundamentally, giving us a new faith by their very own admission. Vigano links the liturgy to this unfortunate state the Church is in when he says, quote, the church is not a society governed by an absolute monarch, free from any higher authority who can impose his whim on his subjects. The head of the church is Christ, and Christ is its only true king and lord, of whom the Roman pontiff is vicar, just as he is the successor of the prince of the apostles. Abusing the vicarious power of Christ and placing oneself outside the succession by proposing heterodox doctrines or by imposing norms that refer to them makes this intrinsic link with Christ the head and with the mystical body church disappear. In fact, the Pope's vicarious power enjoys all the prerogatives of absolute, immediate, and direct authority over the church only to the extent that it conforms to its main purpose, which is the salus anumerum, in the wake of, tradi of tradition and fidelity to our Lord. Moreover, in the exercise of this authority, the Pope enjoys the special graces of state always within the very specific boundaries of this end, while they have no effect where he acts against Christ in the church. And this is why Bergoglio's fu furious attempts, however violent and destructive, 
are destined to break inexorably and will certainly be declared null and void. <laughs> End quote. Folks, I'm going to say it. Dare we hope that a future pontiff will declare the entire Bergolian run null and void, if not the entire or bulk of the post-conciliar era. That would be wonderful, but it probably won't happen this side of a civilization crashing chastisement that Hollywood itself could not even dream up. That's not to say that you should give up or lose hope. These are the times that the laity can strive for sanctity, to offer our sufferings up to heaven in reparation for our sins, and for the conversion of those prelates, including Paca Papa Francis. I know, that's a hard ask. One of the oldest Catholic principles is sanctity through embracing our suffering, and the conversion of even hopeless sinners through our prayers and sacrifices. Yet that is objected to by many today in our age when most of us can't see past our own suffering. We can't see past it enough to hope for the conversion of our enemies. I know it's a hard thing to think about. I, I, I know, I get it. But it is the reaction to the crisis that the saints would have. Now, Vigano offers some sage advice to the laity and the priests of the church in this time. He reminds the laity first that we have rights in the church, one of which is a right to have the faith taught, and that we should demand it of our pastors. That is a basic right we all have. Every Catholic and every human being has a right to the faith and for the church to teach the faith. Quote, the laity are living members of the mystical body, and as such, they have the native right to demand that its visible authority act and legislate in conformity with the mandate it has received from Christ. When this earthly authority, through a permission of providence, acts and legislates against the will of Christ, the faithful must first of all understand that this test is a means permitted by providence to open to them the eyes after decades of deviations and hypocrisy from which they have been overwhelmed, to which many have adhered in good faith precisely because they are obedient to the hierarchy and unaware of the fraud perpetrated against them. When they understand this, they will notice the treasure they have been robbed by those who should have kept it and handed it over to future generations, and not hide it after devaluing it to replace a bad counterfeit. At that point, they will implore the majesty of God to shorten the times of the trial and grant the church a supreme shepherd who obeys Christ, who belongs to him, who loves him, who renders him perfect worship, and quote. Of the priests, the advice is harder because his advice, is fall, if followed, will lead to more Father Altman's and Father Kalchik's and other countless canceled priests who will be smashed by their prelates. Vigano's advice to them is to resist, to stand firm against modernism, against the innovations in the church, and to defend the traditional liturgy. Remember, traditional Catholicism is a lot more than just the traditional Latin Mass. It's not a preference for the traditional Mass. It's an understanding that what we have been told is the faith today is in many ways not the faith itself, but a caricature of the faith or a bad imitation version of it. Quoting Vigano on the advice for priests, quote, My advice to these priests is to resist and show firmness in the face of a series of abuses that have been going on for too long now. It would help them understand that it is not possible to put the apostolic mass on the same level and that invented by Bugini. Ugnini, because in the first, the truth is affirmed unequivocally to give glory to God and to save souls, while in the second, the truth is fraudulently silenced and often denied to please the spirit of the world and to leave souls in error and sin. It's a heck of a statement, folks. Having understood this, the choice between the two rights does not even arise, since reason and faith animated by charity shows us which of them conforms to God's will and which is different. A soul in love with the Lord does not tolerate compromises and is willing to give her life to remain faithful to the divine spouse. End quote. Again, he's making a heck of a statement about the new mass. I'm going to end this by bringing this back to what Bishop Athanasius Schneider said about papalatry. We have a distorted and disordered understanding of the papacy in our times, which Schneider called for an end of as being hopeful of the positive consequences of the present crisis in the church becoming obvious to everyone. The Vigano in his advice to the priest pre prefaces the statement I just read to you by underscoring how we got to this moment of papalatry and how it was used by the modernists in and after the council to renovate the church into their own image and likeness, because that is exactly what they have done. 
quoting Vigano. In the decades preceding the council, the leaders of the church were, were, were well aware of the growing threat represented by the sedition of the modernist infiltrators. For this, Pius XII had to centralize power, but his decision, understandable, however, had the consequence of instilling in the cler clergy that authority in the church is indisputable regardless. While the doctrine teaches us that the uncritical acceptance of any order is servility, not true obedience. Strengthened by this approach of which the bishops and priests felt at the time of Vatican II, whoever carried out the, the coup made use of this obedience to impose what would never have been conceivable until then. At the same time, the post-conciliar indoctrination work and the merciless purge of the few dissenters did the rest. Today's situation allows us to look at the post-conciliar events with greater objectivity, also because the results of the quote-unquote conciliar spring, that's the new springtime, folks, are there for all to see, from the crisis of secular religious vocations to the collapse of the attendance of the sacraments by the faithful. The liberalization of the ancient mass by Benedict XVI has made many priests discover the priceless treasures of the true liturgy who were completely unaware of them, and who in that mass have rediscovered the sacrificial dimension of their priesthood, which makes the celebrant alter Christus and transforms it intimately. Those who have experienced this quote-unquote miracle of grace are no longer willing to give it up. This is why I invite all my confreres, that would be his fellow priests, to celebrate the Mass of St. Pius V and to let Christ, priest, and victim act in their priestly soul and give a solidly supernatural sense to their ministry, end quote. Resisting evil orders is inseparable from defeating the modernists. It's not simply a matter of stop talking about them, they're not really priests or bishops or the Pope. It's resisting their errors, teaching the authentic faith, growing in sanctity in our lives and being willing, if need be, to be martyrs for the faith and for the truth, whether that comes in the form of the red crown or the white crown of martyrdom, or both, as some saints had. Yet in our time, these notions are often shied away from, not only by those who think that any given papal claimant is a luminous pope who is doing the will of God in all things and is basically a walking saint, but even by those who recognize that we are in dire times. That's why tomorrow, unless some major news breaks, I have to that I'll, that I'll have to cover immediately. I have for you a warning from Benedict the Sixteenth on what the great apostasy will look like. The hint I can give you now is that, according to Benedict the Sixteenth, it isn't how we typically envision it. That the apostasy are the faithful breaking away from the modernist infiltrators themselves. Benedict's warning is chilling because he saw the writing on the wall. For now, only my patrons have access to that video, but it will be available Friday to the general public unless some earth-shaking news happens between now and then that requires me to cover that and to delay that video. But what did you think of Vigano's advice, especially in light of the advice given by Bishop Schneider? I'm curious what you think about this. Is the present crisis in the church made more clear by Francis and our odd attitudes towards the papacy? Let me know in the comments what you thought of all of this. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As is sharing this on social media, YouTube really likes it when you do that, actually. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.